Welcome to uh, Logos Bible Study on Wednesday night. Uh, thank you for everyone uh, who's joining tonight. I'm thrilled to be here and to talk about God's word and God's plan. And take us tonight through the scriptures from the very beginning to the very end and really look at what God has planned. And this time of the year really makes us think about what is God's plan in our lives, for the church, for the future. And we've been taught many things, but tonight let's look at what the Bible has to say. And you might have seen the title, The Cosmic Plan, and wondered, you know, what's that have to do with Genesis 3.15? Well, I hope that by the end of this study, you will have understood where I'm coming from. And this Christmas time is a time when we start to see the world look at Christmas and even at Christianity and, and sort of awe at some of the things that, that happens in and around the world. And one of the things that's, that's really happening that's astonishing many, and they're calling it the Christmas star. You can see that CNN has talked about it, People, the Independent out from the UK, just all over the news is this Christmas star that's supposed to appear on December 31st. And what it is is that Saturn and Jupiter are coming to a point where they're so close together. And it is believed by scientists and astronomers that the same thing happened in and around the time of Christ's birth. And that this is such a rare event that it's only happened maybe half a dozen times that we can see over the course of the last little while. And the next one won't happen for decades or even centuries after this. But there's also something else that, that I've read as I'm following the story online. And they say that back in the time of Jesus that also Halley's Comet was around. And that a lot of historians have been looking into what happened during that time and they found that in ancient Korean and ancient Chinese texts that there were re recordings of some kind of a comet or something in the sky that caught, their, that caught their attention, even in that part of the world. And so we look at what's happening during this time. We even have one astronomer, and I've spoken about this before, who actually tried to map what's happening in the skies around Christmas. And, and we sort of have this picture of, of the Christmas star and what could have that have been. And one scientist actually has mapped it back and, and basically has mapped it back to Jupiter, a star called Regulus, and Venus coming together. And the importance around this one is that Jupiter to the Israeli and, and Jewish nation was a sign of righteousness. And Regulus was another sign for a little king or a prince. And Venus was fertility and birth. And so if you can imagine all of these things happening, it's quite phenomenal. And no scientist or astronomer is going to admit, well, you know, this could have been the Christmas star. But think about all of these things being recorded and discussed that all happened around this time. Something important was happening. Something phenomenal was happening. And God was trying to tell everybody. And the wise men knew about it. And that's what attracted them across from where they lived all the way to the other part of the desert, on the other side of the desert from where they were. And so we have this cosmic mystery of all these things happening. We know that God had put in motion creation, and he had put in motion all these things. We look up at the stars, and, and we see the Milky Way, and we see how great this universe is, and all the stars, and we wonder how he did that. And I remember when I was younger, I'd go to the science center, and I used to see this, there was this contraption, and you could put four of these little metal balls, I don't know if it's still there, and you could push this little metal ball, and it would go around in circles, and you really didn't know where it went, but there was a track. Somebody had designed a track for that little ball to move around, and there was, there was some, something that had guided it beforehand. So before I pushed that ball, it had been predetermined how that ball would go in its path. Or think about a baseball player. You know, when they, throw, when they throw a pitch, how they hold the ball, how they can make it curve, how they can make it do different things. Well, for God, this is nothing. For him to put the universe in place and put it in motion, think about it. God is so great and so wonderful and, and so unimaginably understood 
And we just as human beings can't even start to think about what he's done and what he's planned. But he's given us the Bible and scripture. And he's given us a glimpse of what he's tried to do. And so today I'd like to share that with you. And really Christmas has brought to the point that there's something going on. There is a greater plan at work. Something that is for our benefit and for our good. Now, the coming of Jesus and his birth at that time wasn't welcomed by everyone. For one, we know Herod did not see Jesus as favorable. In fact, Herod wanted to kill Jesus and then even sent his soldiers to kill all the male infants under two. And so we know that to Jesus' presence, well, us today, we see it as hope and peace. Back then, Herod didn't think of it as hope and peace, but as a threat to his power and his authority. We look at Jesus' life. Satan was constantly at battle with Jesus, either with his disciples or in the desert. Everywhere, Satan was trying to stop Jesus, but he couldn't. And we also know that the religious leaders found Jesus threatening. He threatened the way they thought. There's something going on with Jesus. Well, we look at Jesus and his birth, we see that he didn't just come to bring hope and peace. He also brought a new way of doing things that threatened many. 1 John 3.8 says this, Whoever makes practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Let me say this again. 1 John 3.8 the reason the, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. That is why Jesus came. Jesus came to put an end to something. Something that happened in Genesis had been going on for a long time. Something that had been in the works and needed to be dealt with. And it didn't just start with Christmas. It started way back in Genesis. And so now I'd like to transport us in time from where we are today not just to the time when Jesus was born, but right back to the beginning, right back to the garden in that situation. Now, I must say something and declare something that there are some mysteries that we will never understand. And one of the mysteries is, and I'll just put it bluntly, is God doesn't create robots. He doesn't. He creates angels and human beings to have choice. We can choose to obey or we can choose to disobey. And he gives us the freedom to choose the freedom to love, and and a bunch of other freedoms. And that is so entrenched in who we are as human beings, even in our culture, that freedom is held so importantly. And that is something that God upheld too, no matter what the cost. And so in Matthew 10, 18, Jesus says this. And this this is where we start to see what is going on in the heavens Jesus says in Matthew 10, 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Something happened. We've all heard this before. Satan rebelled against God. And Jesus testifies that he was cast out of heaven. And Jude 1, 6 even declares that the angels were also punished along with Satan. And so here we have in the heavens this cosmic battle, if, if I could call it that, where Satan and Ezekiel talks about Satan exalting himself and exalting himself to be like God. And we see that that results in him being cast out. And Revelation 12 even testifies that a third of all the angels were actually cast out with him. And you can just imagine what kind of turmoil that would have been for the angels and for everything that's going on. But this rebellion wasn't contained in heaven. This rebellion also continued into the garden. And Satan went right into the creation and tried to bring mankind down with him. And then all of a sudden we have in the Bible, after creation, this dialogue in chapter 3 of Genesis between Satan, Adam, and Eve. And we see that Satan actually starts off kind of, in a, in a, not kind of, but in a deliberate, deceptive way. He, right off the bat, says, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? 
Already he's trying to actually slip in some doubt, trying to get Eve to doubt what she understands. And it goes on that there was this dialogue between Satan and Eve. But verse 4 of chapter 3 is very telling because this is where Satan introduces three fundamental lies. And this is what it says. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. You will, you will be knowing good and evil. Three lies. You will not surely die. Secondly, you will be like God. And thirdly, you will know good and evil. And these three lies that Satan put in front of her tempted her along with a deception and making her question what she knew about God's commandments regarding eating from the tree. And so here we have uh, the situation where they ate of the tree and the fall took place. And this whole cosmic snowball effect of all that happened afterwards and where we are today caused a tremendous disruption to creation. And so what are these lies really saying? Well, here are the three lies. First of all, Satan challenged God's authority, that, any, that his creation could challenge his authority. The second lie was that creation was equal to God. Creation was equal to God. And the third lie is that creation can be separate from God. In other words, know about good and evil, can make their own judgments, they don't need, we don't need God, we don't need his authority, and we can judge for ourselves. Well, guess what? Nothing has changed. Since the time that that happened and those lies came into being, we see that that continues today. We see that continues today that people don't want to know about God, they don't, want, they don't want to care about God, they feel that they can live their life independently from him, and even to the point where they're agnostic and atheist and said, we don't need God, God doesn't exist. We can judge good and bad, righteousness and unrighteousness without the concept of God. One of the important things, though, that we see is that when we look at how the angels were punished and we look, about, uh, look at how Adam and Eve were punished, there's a difference. And we see that in the Bible, when something is omitted and something is inserted, that's very important for us to take notice of. You will notice that when it talks about the angels, it doesn't say that they were deceived or that Satan deceived them in any way, but the angels actually followed Satan were cast out. What we do see is an explicit example of Satan tricking Adam and Eve. And I don't know if that had anything to do to play with how God decided how to treat the situation. But there was a big difference between when the angels fell and when man fell. And we also know that man was made a little less than the angels, as the Bible says. And so all these things might have come to the point where God, all of a sudden, decides to do something very remarkable. And we know that God is a God of second chances. We know that. We know that when we read the stories of Jonah. David, or even our own lives. How often have we fallen and God given us a second chance, even when we don't deserve it? John the Baptist actually said in, in chapter 3 of Matthew, verse 8, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And John the Baptist was seen as, as the last prophet of the Old Testament. And, this, and he said this in Matthew just before Jesus is about to get baptized. And what we know is that from the time of the fall to the time of John the Baptist, that God is seeking repentance. He is giving mankind a second chance. And so here we have a, a fancy word that I'm going to share with you tonight, and it's with regards to Genesis 3.15. Right after the fall, right after we see in verses, chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, the three lies from Satan and how Adam and Eve you know, listen to those lies and fall, we have what some call the Proto-Evangelion. And that just means the first gospel. And what does it mean by the first gospel? Well, when you read it, 
you don't really think of it as being the first gospel because it says this, and I'm reading out of the NIV because I like this translation uh, of this verse. In Genesis 3.15, it says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. People think of, well, how can that be the first gospel? Well, let's take a deeper look at this verse and really see what's going on. The first thing that it says is that we will be, there will be enmity between us and the enemy. In other words, God isn't gonna stop the existence of mankind from continuing. In fact, he has actually chosen mankind despite the fact that we've rebelled and fallen to be going into battle against Satan and the enemy. The enemy that has fought God both in the heavens and on the earth in his creation. And through this seed of mankind, while we may suffer, there is hope. And here's the hope. The hope that one day Satan will be crushed. That through his deception and what he has done with mankind, God will turn the tables and destroy Satan. And with that comes hope. And this is a hope. And this is why a lot of, a lot of people who study the Bible say this is the first guidance of hope the first hope that we have in the Bible that ties in to Abraham's promise and the coming of Jesus. And here we have in Romans some further clarification. And Romans 16, verse 20, says this. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. That promise, that declaration that was done in Genesis 6, sorry, in Genesis 3, 15, is also declared in Romans 16, 20. There is something that God has put in place a plan. And we know that God stands outside of time. And so when, it's hard for us to fathom, but God does not see time like we do. Uh, the Bible says that a day is like a thousand years. I don't want to take that literally, it's just an example for us to understand that time is irrelevant to God. But let's say we take it a little literally. Then the cross only happened a couple of days ago in God's time. Not so long ago. So in other words, this illustration just shows that when we think of the thousands of years that have passed, and when God looks at time, it is completely different and like night and day. And so here we have God's promise in Genesis 315 also coming to life in Romans as Paul writes to the churches. Now, as we're going through this, this whole plan and this, this whole situation that God is putting us at war with Satan, God has to deal with the lies that Satan has put in and the lies that he has brought forth into humankind. And the first lie was that there will be no death. Well, that's the first thing that God deals with right away. In Genesis 3.19, God declares that mankind will return to dust. And right from the time of Adam to Noah, there rushes in a time of such evil and death that we could not even fathom. There, the Bible is clear about how evil proliferated and how God even almost regretted creating man, that it was so bad, and it brought in the flood. And here is the Lord God saying, I'm going to put an end to this. And by doing this, allowing this to happen, God has proven that the lie that, that Satan had put forth is truly a lie, and truly that Satan has been coming to just destroy and through that whole flood experience, God creates a new path and creates a new history and chapter for mankind. And what we see is, we see that God has put an end to the first lie. Now God, from Noah onward, has to deal with the second lie. And the second lie that God has to deal with is that we can be like God. And so what we see in, from Noah, in the time of Noah, all the way up to the time of Moses, 
is we see several things happening. We see the explosion of nations and empires coming, to, coming forth. We see the vastness of huge city-states and empires where kings or pharaohs are made to be like gods. We see the lie that Satan brought forth that we as human beings can be like God. There are so many examples in history of people in positions of power, the pharaoh and others claiming to be God. We also see how man has turned religion into something that serves him. Here is God's truth in which he brings a seed. And God had always maintained a seed, even through before the time of Noah, right up through Noah, and after Noah, a seed of truth, of people who follow his truth, through Abraham, Jacob, and Joseph, all the way up through to Moses. There's always been a seed of truth, but there's always been this divergence of truth, and mankind creating different religions. Religions that if, you, if they believe that if they do something, that the gods will serve them a complete lie that Satan had brought in. And so God allowed this proliferation of mankind into these empires and the city-states, and all of this to prove something. Man was buying into, mankind was buying into Satan's second lie. But as we see, that lie came to an abrupt end in that people started to see what it is that a man, can a man be God? Can Pharaoh be God? We saw what happened with Moses. And it's a very interesting time, the time that, that we go, that all these empires are, are being established and Egypt is becoming this great empire and nation and worshiping the Pharaoh like a god. But we see also at the time, and this is something interesting in history, is the oldest story, an, or, an original story that was brought in the Bible, Job. Job is believed to be the oldest recorded story. Not the oldest story in time, but the oldest recorded story in the Bible. And it would have been recorded at the time as of, of Abraham and his children, and possibly right through to the time around Joseph where the Jewish people are entering into Egypt. And they would have had this story this story that explains something about their circumstance and their relationship to God and what's going on. And just to summarize, because we could go to Job and, and that could be an entire, uh, an entire lesson in itself, but here, here's some highlights of Job. Satan, in, in, the, in the story, attacks Job, takes everything away from him, takes away his possessions, his children, and even his wife, and even his health, almost to death, Job is left with absolutely nothing. And there comes a point where Job is actually almost accusing God and wondering how, how this injustice could be thrust on him. And Job then questions, why is he suffering? Like, why is this happening to me? And then God reveals his majesty. And God just basically tells Job, just quiet down and listen to me. Are you the one that created everything? Are you the one that put the stars in the heavens? And it goes on to one of the, one of the most beautiful poetic uh, pro proses in the Bible. And then Job realizes how small he is in God's eyes. And so we hear, we see Job turning and then starting to trust God. And as soon as Job trusts God, God then delivers Job from his situation. And you see this battle between Satan and mankind and Job right back at Genesis 3.15. God declared that there would be enmity between the seed of the woman and Satan. And Job is the perfect example. And it's, one of the, it's the oldest recorded story. And so think about this. The Jewish people would have had this story as they went into Egypt. And this story would almost be a mirror image of what they're going through. Why is this happening to us? Isn't this unjust? Why are we being made slaves? And then here comes along Moses. And Moses comes along and he challenges Pharaoh. And here is, here is an outcast of the Egyptian people coming in with a rod, having nothing except trust in God. And he comes in and with the 10 plagues 
shows how man cannot be God. And in this instant, in this time, God destroys Satan's second lie. Man cannot be God. First of all, man cannot exist without God. And if he tries to, all there is is death and destruction. And secondly, that man is not God and cannot be God and cannot stand up to God. And yet, we see that this then ushers in a different era. And God starts to deal with the last lie that Satan had. And the last lie was that you would know good and evil. In other words, what Satan is saying is, you would know how to distinguish between good and evil. In other words, if you're like God, and you know the difference between good and evil, then you don't need God. You can make the choices on your own. Who needs God? There are a lot of people out there, just like I said before, who would think that why would we need God? God is, is, I can make the choices, I can live without God. Maybe, I used to believe this when I was an unbeliever. I used to think, you know, God may be out there, I don't know who he is. When I die, I'll meet who God is, and, and that'll be better than if I try to think of who he is. I'll just live my life the way I think is what's right and wrong. And a lot of people think this way. And Romans 2.15 highlights something and in Romans 7, 7 as well, but in 2.15 it teaches us that the law is written on our hearts. It is our conscience. And in Romans it tells us that up until the time of Moses, really, we existed in the world, yes, through interventions that God would bring in, prophetic messages, angels, but really the laws that were on our hearts was really what, was, what, was, what we were following, what was ruling over our lives. And we demonstrated how poorly we are at trying to distinguish between good and evil without it. But then Paul in Romans 7, 7 says that, yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. So this is how God deals with the third lie. He basically brings in the law, ushers in the Ten Commandments, ushers in the law, and all of a sudden, he calls out the Jewish nation, and he says, okay, here you go. Here is the law. Here is something for you to follow and to live your life. Can you be righteous? And we know what happens. We know what happens in this situation. We know that the Jewish people, at first, in came the judges, and the Jewish people did, did not have it very easy. I mean, God had said that the heel would be bruised, but people don't like to suffer. And so after a time, people started complaining. They started complaining that they don't have a king. They don't have a kingdom. They don't have a capital city. We're not like everyone else. What's going on? And all of a sudden, they started complaining, and they started calling out to God's prophet and to God to say, we want a king. It wasn't good enough that they had the law. It wasn't good enough that God had brought them out from under a fake God a king, and an empire, and proven that Satan's lie cannot be true. He even gave them the law, and here they are with the law, and they're demonstrating they can't even live under the law, or even understand it, or its purpose. And so they do. That's what they do, is they bring on a king. And God warned them. And God told the prophet, they aren't rejecting you, they're rejecting me. And that's what the people of God did. They rejected God. They rejected God, they had the law, they were in the promised land, but it wasn't good enough for them. And so they, they got the king, and God warned them, with the king, they will take your sons and your possessions, and you will suffer. And we see the history of what happened. All of, these, all of the kings of Israel, we see how they came about. Yeah, there were some good kings, but even some of the better kings that we see like David, we see how he fell and sinned. Um, here's your great leader. Um, and David was called a man after God's own heart. Look at Solomon, asked for wisdom. And in the end, he was sinning as well. And we, we saw some terrible, in scripture, some really terrible kings and leaders. And the kingdom got divided. And things got so bad that under the law, the people could not handle it. They could not handle distinguishing between good and evil and choosing righteousness. 
they chose evil many times, and so God punished them. And this is, this is what ended up happening. They ended up being punished and exiled. Exiled into far off lands east of Palestine. Almost lands from where even Abraham came from. And in today's modern day would be around Iraq and in those areas of the world. And so a lot of them were just taken away and, and, and placed there as punishment. But there's an astonishing thing in this plan. It isn't something that God didn't know it would happen. God knew that this was going to happen, and he knew that mankind couldn't deal with it. But it's almost like we had to experience it. We needed to experience, as, as a race, we needed to experience that Satan's lies that we had believed, and that those lies that had carried on from generation to generation were not true, and that we needed God. That had to be proven. I remember a long time ago, and, and I'm going to tell you a little story. A long time ago, um, our real estate uh, agent from a long time um, had told us a story about his daughter. And he always used to barbecue. And his daughter would always come over to the barbecue, and he always used to tell his daughter, don't, it's hot, don't touch. And every time he would go and barbecue, the daughter was curious, wanting to put her hand and on the barbecue, because it was hot, he said, don't touch the barbecue, it's hot. So one day, he decides he isn't going to say anything. So the daughter comes over, and he allows the daughter to touch the barbecue. Burns her finger, now he made sure it wasn't in an area that was too hot, but burns her finger a little bit. She starts bawling all her eyes out. The mom comes in, why did you let this happen? And the father basically says, I'm tired of telling her not to touch the barbecue. And she's old enough to know now. Well, you know what he said? She never touched the barbecue after that. There is something about us experiencing correctiveness, being corrected and disciplined, experiencing the negative effects of our bad choices, not only individually, but collectively and over time that helps us change. We look at places like Canada, our history, a lot of the things that we've gone through as a nation with the world wars or other things have shaped who we are today. So there is, there is a collective, cosmic type of mystery here that we as individuals need to experience change and change over time. But we also as humanity need to experience change and change over time and experience the negative aspects of it. And so here we are now in this exiled place. But it's in this exiled place that you have the story of Esther and Mordecai. This wonderful story of how God even delivers the people who are exiled. You see, he never gave up. He never did. He didn't give up on Adam and Eve in Genesis in 3.15, declaring what he did, and he maintained a seed, even when he had to discipline the people of God, who thought that they could in their own pride and strength follow the law and be righteous. And here we have Daniel coming in. Daniel being someone who had been elevated under several kings. Someone who was put above all the learned wise men of the kingdom. And he managed them. He was, he was the second in command. Whatever he, he wanted to do, he could do. And I could just see how his influence had a big impact. And guess what? It's in these lands of exile, in these lands where Esther and Mordecai were, in these lands where Daniel had such a prominent, prominent position over the wise men. It's where the wise men came from. Do you see the connection? Here are the wise men at Christmas coming in and they're coming in from a far place. They're coming in from a place where Daniel once was, where the Jewish people once was. They're coming from a place where Daniel ruled over all the wise men and the astrologers and, and all of those people. And I, I don't know. I, that's one thing I will ask the Lord when I get there. I don't know what kind of influence he had, but I think 
he had a tremendous influence because when Jesus came, all of a sudden, out of the blue, three wise men knew something important was going to happen. And they could interpret that something tremendous was going to happen, and you have to wonder, how did they know? If the exile hadn't happened, would they have been able to know? And let me read Revelation chapter 12, because Revelation chapter 12 is one of my favorite chapters in Revelations because it really talks about everything that is going on. The whole cosmic plan, as I put it, the plan of God and how he has brought everything together. Let me read it. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with sun, with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains in the agony of giving birth. Now 12 in the Bible is always representative of the church. And another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great dragon appeared. And with the seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems, his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth. We know what we're talking about. We're talking about Satan that, is, that was spoken in Jude. Satan that Jesus spoke, I saw Satan being cast out of heaven. The same Satan who had fallen and caused Adam and Eve to fall. This is the dragon. And after his, his tail, it says here, his tail in verse 4 swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations, and with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And this is where we see the promise of God from the seed of the woman in Genesis 3.15 would come a savior. And the woman fled into the wilderness. Now remember, the woman represents the church. Where she, had been pla- where she was placed, prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now, war rose in heaven. Now, we're going back to that cosmic battle. The Bible, in these stories, a lot of times isn't linear, but a lot of times jumps back and forth. And so now we go to where this dragon came from. Now, war rose, uh, arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He, has, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. This then brings us back to Job, where Satan would go to heaven and accuse the people of God. And and we see in this story in Job how Job was accused by Satan of only serving God because of the favor he had. And they have conquered him, verse 11, and they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. Who is they? That's us. They have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. Remember, going back to Genesis, we see the connection here where we are at enmity between us and Satan. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she may fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and a half. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to help the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. 
Then the dragon became furious with the woman, went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who kept the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus, and he stood on the sand of the sea. This chapter, right in the middle of Revelation, talks about this cosmic plan that was put in place. It started with the the rebellion of Satan coming down, causing mankind to fall, but then God giving hope through a battle that would start. And that battle was one that began in the heavens, poured itself out in the garden, and swept mankind into this time of having to deal with Satan, his lies. And in in Ephesians, we see how this battle takes place. And this isn't a battle where we're entering into war. This is a battle that is about spiritual things, principalities. Ephesians tell us that we need to put on the full armor of God, that our battle is a spiritual battle. It's not about how what things happen to us. Think of Job. Think of all he lost. The battle is about trusting in God. The battle is about fighting spiritually. And as we learn from Scripture, Jesus came, and through his coming, we received the Holy Spirit. And in Revelation, we see that he came, destroyed what Satan had put in place. And it says in the Bible that when, be, that when he died on the cross and went to heaven, that he had gained victory over death and Satan. Now we see almost this ironic mirror of what happened. A battle occurred by a tree, and the first Adam fell. And now we see coming to Jesus, the second Adam, and another battle, and a different tree, the cross. And now that battle restoring what was broken. And it says in the Bible that In 1 Corinthians 15, it says that Jesus as the second Adam is the life-giving spirit, brought the life-giving spirit. In other words, Jesus brought us the Holy Spirit. And for the first time, because of Jesus' coming, we have the Spirit of God in us. We are his temple. We now know the truth. We are not God's. We cannot be like God, and we cannot choose between right and wrong without God. And we don't have to depend on ourselves. There's no more about human effort or or human ingenuity or self-determination like we saw in history. Now we have the Spirit of God in us, and we can live with his guidance on a permanent basis. And so we have here the wise men of Christmas, To me, they symbolize something great that happened in the heavens while something was happening here on earth. And it's funny because this Friday we had our our youth group and Zach was speaking. And the message is about how God can see the difference between the the trees, the forest from the trees. And that God, he he showed some some pictures of, of views of standing over a city and seeing everything that's going on but also that God can also see the trees. He knows the details. In other words, Jesus came down to earth to be a human being, to make himself and put himself into a vulnerable position, to be born, to be hated, to be pursued uh, so that they would kill him. And he did that, and he experienced suffering He experienced everything that we experienced. And he knows who we are. And he knew our plight. And so the Bible is clear. God doesn't just have this big plan in place. God knows us by name. The psalm said that God knew us before we were formed. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He just doesn't care about this cosmic plan the coming of Christ is also about how he cares about you. How he cares about how you 
are in this world. Yes, we are in a small little span of space, in our own little corner of the church, whereas the church is worldwide. And it's this, it's this big body of believers, all clinging to God. But the reality is, is that God cares about every single one of us. And we can stay here today, and we can remember the wise men, we can look up at the stars, we can look at Christmas, and we can look at everything that has happened. And the one thing that we can do is maybe like Job, is just sit back, regardless of our circumstance, regardless of everything that might happen to us in this life, and just realize how big and awesome God is, and how much we need him, and how if we put our trust in him, that God can restore us to a place where he wants us to be. He has made a promise, and that promise is that if we follow him, that if we believe in him, and if we accept him as our Lord, that we will one day be restored to that place that he intended in the first place, and that there won't be any more suffering, no more tears, and that we'll be given a new body and a new life, and that Jesus had declared that, and you heard him in, in, in the Gospels. In heaven he has many rooms and he has many places for us. Are you ready to be one of those people who take that journey with Jesus to that new place? That is what Christmas is about. Nothing happens by chance. Everything here is planned by God. God has a plan for your life, just like he has a plan for all of humanity. He has a plan for you he has a promise for you, and he has hope for you. And I hope that this message and this, this journey across the Bible from the very end of, of the Bible in Revelation to the very beginning demonstrates how God is in control. And then when we realize that and come to a point where we can fathom how great he is and how much he loves us and how much he despite our freedom, despite our failures, that he'll continue to give us a second chance and a third chance, how much he loves us. And then we can really understand in Luke 2.14 when it says, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That is part of the Christmas story. And I hope that that is part of your hope and that you will enter this Christmas thinking about God and how great he is and how this small moment of time, cherish it, cherish it with your family. Cherish it as something that is special from God, but also remember that there is something greater and wonderful at play here, a God who is redeeming his people a God who is bringing his people to him. And I hope and pray that you are part of God's family. And if you aren't, you can say this one simple prayer here tonight and be part of that great plan. And that prayer is one where you surrender everything to God. You surrender your life and confess that yes, he is God greater than all things. And so as I close tonight, I'll say a prayer for that. For those of you who have never said this prayer, please say this prayer along with me. And then I'll also pray that God would bless you in this season. Now, next Bible study, we'll take a look at a different aspect of Christmas. But in tonight's, I hope that you've seen how big and wonderful God is and how much he's in control. Let us pray. Father, I just bring before you, even if there's anyone who has not understood that you and your love is eternal and that you desire that all of us would come to be with you one day. And so, Lord, I pray that everyone who is hearing this message would understand that love. And if you are listening and you have never 
committed yourself to Christ, repeat this. Lord, I believe that you are God and that Jesus Christ is your son. I believe that you have a plan for me and for mankind. And that plan is in your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for my sins. And I confess that I am a sinner and that I need you. And I confess and believe that he rose again and conquered death and Satan. And that he now sits with you in glory as we do battle and march forth as your children to be with you one day. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. And for all those who have that hope, I pray that this Christmas, that you would be strengthened despite all the things that are happening around us. That you would trust in God as Job did. That no matter what is taken away from us, no matter what events are happening in this world, no matter how isolated we are, we have Christ in us. We have the Spirit of God who guides us. We are no longer empty, an empty temple. We are now the temple of God, and His Spirit lives in us. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.